Hi, I'm Sophie, as you know now. Um, I'm a bit of a control freak, so um, what I'm going to talk to you about is the fact that whatever you do, it's good to relinquish that control. And I'm going to repeat an incident, I'm going to tell you an incident that happened of how I let go of that control. So an incident happened about um, when my daughter was seven, where she had a swimming pool party. There was also an imbalance that was happening within me at that time regarding advertising, which is what I was doing. And um, I felt it was time, I was not getting satisfaction from it. Of course, there was like lots of money, but there was, something was not working somewhere. And there was that imbalance inside. So she had the swimming pool party. We had the lifeguards, we had everything, but one, her best friend drowned. And um, the entire rushing her to the hospital, she was in coma, the x-ray showed that 75% of her brain was dead. The doctors had pretty much written her off and all that was going on. So what I controlled really was the environment, the hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, the friends who could visit, the parents, friends who could come in, the relatives. You know, those things you can control. But you really cannot control the fact, is, is she going to live or is she going to die? <clears throat> and I believed inside of myself that she was going to live. I just believed it totally. So I passed on that feeling of positivity to everyone that was coming in my sphere and I made them believe that she was going to live, okay? There was like prayers, every religion was praying for her. They had set up chain prayers all over the world for her and for one month she was in coma. She opened her mind, ma, I mean she opened her eyes after one month and then she just went into the screaming so that every time her eyes were open she was like, ah, she would just scream and that she went through a period of time. But there was that little change that was happening and I still believed that she, everything was going to be okay. And I targeted uh, her birthday, which was two months later, as to be able to see proof of the fact that she is going to live. I mean, that she's going to be alive, you're going to see her memory, she's going to be okay, you're going to see all of that. And then uh, slowly she got transferred to a house and she would be sitting on the bed and she would just look at one spot in the ceiling like that all the time. She would not respond to anybody, not her name, nothing. She was just like this. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a hopeless situation for anybody to face. But I just believed it really, really strongly. Then her birthday happened and uh, we went across and they had not had any party. She was sitting on her father's lap and still looking at the ceiling like that in this vacant manner at some point in the ceiling. And um, there, 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 was, there was no crowd there, there was just my family. And there was um, a father, mother, Tanya of course, and grandmother and brother, sister. And I was having this whole internal dialogue because it, had, it was like almost 8 in the evening and I was like, you know, I really believe this so strongly that something was going to happen today. And uh, I was sitting there and I was staring at her and I was thinking, hmm, I mean, what is, I mean, I was kind of having a debate with myself regarding the universe, regarding the divine, regarding all of that. So I looked at the mother and I said, have you cut the birthday cake? So she said, uh, no, we decided we won't cut the birthday cake this year, you know, Tanya being the way she is. So I, so I said, hello, birthday cake is a celebration of life. It's not about whether she's good or what condition she's in, but we're going to celebrate her life. So we're going to cut the birthday cake. So they had got used to taking direction from me because they got some astrologer when this had happened. And the astrologer had predicted that she was going to have a death experience when she was seven years old. So when this happened, they went back to the astrologer and the astrologer said, the person that she's had, had it with has got a very strong energy. So there's a likelihood that she might live, okay? So they were looking at me with great gratitude that this incident happened with me. So that's a different that's a different trip from a guilt trip, okay? So, so because they were used to taking that direction, they they went and got some sponge cake from the from the shop downstairs. And Tanya is sitting on her father's lap and looking at the ceiling in this in this manner, at this point in the, there. And I was angry. The whole lot was angry because I was forcing them to do this. And then they took out the candles and they placed the candles there. And the mother lit the candles and uh, Tanya went tuck and she looked at the candles and then she went. She blew out the candles and then she took it in this motor, uncoordinated kind of manner. She took this knife, she cut it, she grabbed a piece of it and she went and raised it up to her mother and then she hesitated and she turned around and she fed her father first. And then she fed the mother and you saw the entire memory coming back. So that incident changed me a great deal and there was no going back to advertising after that. I shut shop 
and um, I relinquished, relinquished any control that I had to this universe and I started believing in and I based my life on that universe. And my second incident of how the foundation came about is really about the fact that when I watched, started watching, started teaching myself a lot because I wasn't working for a period of one, two years, I just decided what I want to do will come to me. So in, in that period of two years, I started educating myself in documentaries, went to a lot of festivals, learned a lot about um, you know, stuff, the distribution of documentaries and all of that, the business side of documentaries. And I realized for me that when a documentary film finishes, I'm still curious as to what has happened to that protagonist in the documentary or the situation in the documentary. Has that protagonist achieved education? Did she get married? Did she not get married? What happened next? To the extent I was calling up filmmaker friends of mine and says, hey, listen, what happened to that boy? Yeah, did he get educated? What happened to that blind parents? Did they manage to get that, that STV booth that they wanted? And I was doing stuff like that. So I realized I wanted to work in the aspect of after a documentary film is finished, what happens to the after part of it? How, how am I going to work in that? So I came up with a period of time with a very unique, personal, fantastic idea that we can create change with that aspect of documentary. Okay, and I, this is like really a unique idea. I was talking to everybody about it, and uh, most of the, the reaction that you would normally get is like, fool. I mean, what? I mean, no, who watches documentaries? Seriously, I'm supposed to talk about what happens after a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know anything. I didn't even know the word impact. I just knew you can create change if you work with that area. You know, can collect money. That person can get an STD boat. So the vision was a very smallish vision. What about it? But it had started settling so well into my DNA that I believe that I was the only one that was capable of doing that. So in traveling to festivals, I'm Googling people, by which time they're slowly doing the paperwork, starting up the foundation, and getting through all those processes in place. As many of you already realize, it's all a, it's all a huge process, system-driven stuff, and a headache. But um, going to Sheffield Festival, I've been Googling before that, and I've been seeing there were certain, look, you see, funding NGOs, NGOs, foundations that fund NGOs. Sometimes I'll be all of them. Nothing was related to this. Okay, so I was going through various and making points on various funding organizations and doing all of that to try and get some money. And there were a couple of organizations that I was getting attracted to and the work that they were doing, rather the way that they were commuting, or communicating what they were doing through their website. So that was what was really attracting me. So then, I, when I went to Sheffield Festival. The, there was this group of women called Doc Society who run this bar in the evenings where they match make filmmakers with technicians and they bar in. These are really cool women. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and maybe I'll share my idea and they could be able to give me some ideas about where I can get money from. So I went there and sitting across the bar I managed to, you know, grab away with these women and they said, you know, to next tomorrow we are doing a good pit session for one hour. So why don't you come and watch it and see it? You could not talk your idea. There was so much noise, there was so much buzz, everyone, all the filmmakers that busy pitching their films and all of that. You did your idea of, okay, I want to work with what is happening after the documentary was not the conversation you wanted to have in that zone. Okay? So we went, so I went next day for Good Pitch and I sat and watched Good Pitch. And I looked at it and I said, That's my idea. How are these guys doing my idea? You know? And they were doing it at such a level of fitness and it was too good, I wanted this for India. It was very clear that I wanted this for India. So when I approached them, I said, listen, can, we, can, I, can you bring this to India? I think this is perfect for India. And I started chasing them on it. Oh, OK, let's see. It was like that. But I just come from advertising to documentary. I had no, no standing in documentary. So came back, I got what I did get permission for is to be able to copy the idea and not use the name Good Pitch, but do it in a much smaller level. So I approached a festival in Kerala called the Kerala Film Festival and I said, listen, this idea is really good. Why don't we try and do this? So they funded it and we brought it in as Trigger Pitch. So we did that in the first year as Trigger Pitch. The second year we got some funds and came in a second time around, applied to these funding organizations, the whole gambit of this I applied to. And finally somebody gave us, IDFA gave us a small fund. So brought it again into Kerala as, as a, as a uh, Trigger Pitch again. The third year, at the end of the second year, Doc Society, which are the school women, sends me a mail saying, we got a bit of fun, do you want to take good pitch to India? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it was like that. The universe just worked it. I found my tribe. You know, it just, just all fell into place. So we've done good pitch in 2013, we've done good pitch in 2018, which is supported by Tata Trust. And now we are doing it again in 20, it's in April, I mean March 4th, which is supported by Ford Foundation. We did good pitch Karnataka. 
which we where we go regional, and now in, the, in by November we're taking it into Goodrich Deccan. But now again an imbalance has started, and I'm wondering, okay, now certain ideas are coming to place as to in which direction it should go. So it's always ready to constantly innovate yourself when you're feeling like, okay, this balance is not working. This has now happened. Now how else can you improve on it? In which way do you go? And you open yourself up to that. So I just relinquish all control and just wake up in the morning. You go through the frustrations, humiliations, mistakes. Or be called an idiot, you'll be called a fool, you'll be calling yourself an idiot and a fool. But it makes you wake up in that morning and just feel hopeful for the day and say, it's all out there, so I'm going to saw something will happen and then you just go with it. This is my story.